Hey there, I'm Lewis. Today I brought a setup that leans more into playing around in Blender than having a strict technical setup that I want to produce. We are gonna create these fun alien worms and without further ado, let's just get started. So in Blender, I want to drag open a new GeoNodes window. Um, by the way, it took me a while to find this out, but you can just press the first letter of the context that you want to open. So if I want to open a GeoNodes editor, you can just press G. The first thing we're going to do is create a base shape that we are then going to instance onto a curve. So let's create a new GeoNode setup and I'll call this base shape. And for good measure, I will also rename the cube to base shape. Also, I like to turn on snapping up here. It helps me keep my node setups a bit tidier. And now I want to start with a volume cube. Now with that volume cube, this is a neat little trick that I learned years back and I was using mostly in shaders. You can use the distance from the origin to drive the density of the cube. So if you use a position node here, take the length of it and then cap that off with a compare node set to less than, we can drive the density with this. So if I set this to 0.3, this will create a sphere with the radius of 0.3. Now let's set up the resolution of the volume cube. 32 is a little bit low. And for me, a good sweet spot usually is 128 because this runs quite smoothly on my PC, but you might have to adjust for your setup. Afterwards, we want to create a mesh out of this. So we need a volume to mesh. What we can do now is influence these position coordinates using a noise, for example. So if we grab another vector math node and a simple noise. You can use the color output here to offset our position here. Let's tick off the normalize. And at the moment, this is quite dispersed and we can use another vector math set to scale to adjust how strongly the noise affects the position offset. Also, the scale of the noise can be reduced quite a bit. Okay, before I play around a little bit more, I want to set up the rest of this base shape because if you want to make any blob look like something you just mirror the object because our brain always sees patterns in symmetry so if i go into the modifiers i just add a mirror modifier and set it to bisect two and this already looks a bit more interesting afterwards i want to smooth out the object too i usually set the repeat to three or four and then adjust the factor until it looks fine so back in our geometry nodes we can now quickly adjust our volume cube here because we are using the mirror modifier. We are basically throwing away half of our mesh here, which means that we are calculating double the voxels and then throw them away. So what we can do is cut off our volume cube. To cut this off, we can set the X component of our bonding box on the min to zero and then adjust the resolution on the X axis by half, so to 64. And now if we turn back on the mirror modifier, we basically have the same shape, but are only using half the resources. So now I want to play around with the noise texture a little bit more. You can follow what I'm doing, but you can also play around with it by yourself. I want a little bit more control over the separate axis. So I will add a multiply node here and I can now influence how strong the X, Y, and Z components of the vector are influencing the shape. If you get these disjointed parts, don't worry about those. We will get rid of them in a moment. Also, what I want is a bit more difference in the detailing of the noise, because at the moment this is all quite uniform and I kind of want part of it to be more smooth and other parts of it to be more rough. And a way to do this that worked for me here was to separate out the Z component of the position and then drive the detail parameter of the noise with it. So if I separate the components and funnel the Z component into a color ramp, the detail at the moment is set to two. So I also want to multiply this afterwards by two and I will switch these around. So anything that is below zero of the Z component will be two and everything above will be zero. So I can adjust the ramp here a bit and I could also up the detail scale here and then you can really see how this affects the shape. All right, now let's get rid of those floating shapes nearby. Any trick that I found for this is measuring the face area of any mesh island, so of any connected mesh part and then comparing it to the biggest part and then deleting everything that is not the biggest part. So let's first grab a bunch of nodes like the cumulate field node, we need a face area and we need a attribute statistic node and of course a mesh island node. What the accumulate field does is 
sum up a field input. This means if we plug in the face area here, it will add up all the face areas of all the individual faces here. A nice thing that this node has is a group ID, so we can separate the field into different groups. And we can use the island index here to separate out any disconnected parts. Now I can use the attribute statistic node to read out the maximum value of this and then use a compare node to compare the accumulated field here against uh, the maximum here. Set this to less than. The selection now will be all the parts that are smaller than the biggest part. So now we can use a delete node to delete those parts. And now we always have only one singular part. I will now play around a little bit more with the noise values here until I find a shape that I'm satisfied with. Also, if you want to affect the overall shape, we can also use another multiply node here and basically squish the whole shape. If you want it more flat, then you could adjust, for example, the z-axis here. I think I'm quite happy with this shape for now. If needed, we can still adjust this later. Now let's start with the curve. And for now, we can move our shape to the side here and grab a new busy curve. For this curve, we want to set the resolution to 128. I just set up a little bit of a shape that is a bit more interesting. Now let's create a new GeoNode setup as well. I rename this to Instance Curve. And the first thing we want to do here is use a Instance on Points node and grab our base shape, drag it in here, and then instance those onto our Bezier Curve. At the moment, this is only instanced three times because Blender only sees the three control points of the Bezier Curve and not the points on the curve itself. For that, we need a resample curve. I like to set this to length as it is the most consistent one. The next step is rotating the shapes on the curve so that they are aligned with the flow of the curve. We can use a axis to rotation node and the normal and the curve tangent. The normal will be the Z component and the tangent will be the Y component. If we plug this in here, this follows the shape nicely. What we want now is to set up the scale of the instances so this doesn't have the uniform thickness. And for this we can use a spline parameter node, so use the factor to drive the scale of our instances. If we just plug in the factor into the scale here, we get a scale from 1 to 0. And this is not what I want because I want this to taper off at both ends. And to do this we need to offset our factor using a math node subtracting 0.5. If we take a look at our curve really quick and check our attribute, let's make this more visible. At the moment we are getting negative values here because we are offsetting our factor by 0.5. So afterwards what I want is to only have positive values and we can do this by using another math node and set it to absolute. Now if we plug this into the scale, this should look the same. You see that it is the wrong way around, but we can use a float curve to easily invert this. Also, we can use the float curve to drive the shape. At the moment, what this is missing is remapping the value to be between 0 and 1. Because we are subtracting 0.5, our values range from 0 to 0.5. So we need to double that. So multiply this by 2. And now our float curve is working fine. Now let's get to animating our shape. I visualize this real quick. We can use a curve to points node here. Let's set the point radius a little bit smaller and also set this to evaluate it. And now to animate this, I want every point to move to its next point position over time. And for this, we need to find out the position on the curve of the next point. So every point here has a factor. For example, this could be 0.1 and this could be 0.3. What this point then needs to do is over time add the amount that is needed to reach 0.3. So to find out how far they are apart, we need this value and subtract it from this value. In this case, this would be 0.2. And to move this value along, so it would be 0.1 plus d times a t value, which is between 0 and 1. The first thing we need is to find out the index of the next point by using a offset point and curve node and set the offset to 1. And we then want to sample the factor. So we need a blind parameter node again and a evaluated index node. 
this goes into the index and the factor is the thing we want to sample. And as we said, the d value is derived by subtracting the factor of the next point by the own factor. So we need a half node here. Let's subtract our factor from the next points factor. Then we need the t value, which will be just multiplied out for now. And now we need a set position node and we need to sample our base busy curve at this factor. So we need a sample curve here. This is the factor that we want to sample and this will spit out a position. And of course, we need the plan parameter again and add onto this our result here. If we multiply our distance value here, you can see now that our points are sliding along the curve. And apparently the curve is the other way around than I thought, but the concept still holds true. So if I set this to 1, every point should be at the next point's position, which you can see because the last point disappears and moves here. And at the last point we will have two overlapping points because the last point has no next point to sample and thus stays where it is. To animate this now we need a scene time node and we want to use the frame value here to drive our multiply node. For this, let's divide our frame by the amount of time that this animation should last. So if I want this to last one second with a frame rate of 24 FPS, I want to divide this by 24 and then plug this into our multiply node here. And if I play this, our points nicely move along. The thing is at the moment, they will all move towards the last point and I want this to be a, a looping motion so that once the 24 frames are reached, every point moves back to its original position. And we can do this by using a modulo, or the easier thing would be to use a fraction here. And this will only look at the numbers behind the decimal point. So if this jumps to 1.1, this basically will be 0.1 again. And if we take a look, this is now nicely looping. One thing that I want to set up here is to prevent the first point here from moving as it will move every factor attribute for every point forward too and thus lead to an inconsistent factor attribute which is a problem because we want to use the factor later on for the shade act for example. So we can use a endpoint selection and invert this using a boolean math node set to not and use this as the selection. So if we look now the first point and the last point won't move at all. Now let's have a look how this looks with our shapes and at the moment we are now having these jumps in there. And this is because we are using the normal and the tangent vector of the own points which are changing quite a lot while they are moving about and we can prevent this by sampling the tangent and the normal of our curve here and storing them on our points. So let's use a sort named attribute. I will set this to vector and I conveniently name this tan and this nor and then we just plug in these two and this needs to happen before we set the positions because otherwise they will sample different positions on the curve. Let's now get rid of those and use named attributes for those. This, this goes in here, this goes in here. We can delete those and if we look at the animation now this looks a lot better. At the moment the first instance here pops in a little too big. To prevent this we can adjust our float curve here a little bit. Also, we can decrease our resample length. And now this already looks quite interesting. So this is the base for the animation done. Now I want to implement a bit more artistic control. For example, I want to be able to reverse the curve movement. For this, we will add a reverse curve here and use a new group input here to drive this. I want to set the default to zero, so the default is just a normal curve. And I can use the value in the geonodes here now to invert the curve. The next thing that I want control over is the scale of the curve, because our Bezier curve internally has a radius attribute that I want to be able to control. And if I were to use that now, nothing happens. And for this, we want to save another attribute onto our curve here. And this will be the radius. We'll use our unused value slot here and store a new attribute here. This needs to be a float and I call this red. And now at our point instancing here, we need to multiply this by this attribute. Now here with the curve, I can use the shortcut Alt S to scale up different parts of the curve. 
To further shape our spline here, you can use the shortcut Ctrl T to rotate the control points around its own axis. And that's it for now. We're gonna finish the setup in the next video, where we are gonna build the shader and finish the animation. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If anything is unclear or you need help, please let us know in the comments. And I'm looking forward to the next video.